So what did Ezra say about Cyrus, anointed servant of God? God called him by his name, declared him to be shepherd, fulfiller of prophecy, champion of Israel. Was he a believer according to Ezra, or was he saved? Let's see. Bible Knowledge Commentary says, The proclamation of Cyrus, 1, 1 to 4, and Ezra, Cyrus, the king of extensive Persian realm, drafted a proclamation that allowed the Israelites to return to their land and rebuild their temple. Cyrus made the proclamation in his first year, 538 B.C. This was the first year of his reign over Babylon, but he had been king over other territories for more than 20 years. He had been in power since 559, when he became the king of Anshan. Then he became king of Medo-Persia, about 550 B.C. He conquered Babylon in October, 539, and became the king of Babylon, a title of honor denoting the highest position in the civilized world, as is evidenced from Cyrus's attitude concerning the God of Israel, whom he did not worship. He was not a true believer in Yahweh. Cyrus's concern was to establish strong buffer states around his empire, which would be loyal to him. Smart conquerors did that. Also, by having his subject peoples resettled in their own countries, he hoped to have the gods in various parts of his empire praying for him to his gods, Bel and Nebo. The famous Cyrus Cylinder, 538 BC, which records his capture of Babylon and his program of repatriating his subject peoples in their homelands, includes this statement, May all the gods whom I have resettled in their sacred cities daily ask Bel and Nebo for a long life for me. The fulfilling of Jeremiah's words, Jeremiah 29.10, also 25, 11 to 12, was totally God's doing. <clears throat> Seventy years of Jewish captivity in Babylon were about to end. The first deportation of Jews to Babylon was in 605 B.C. Cyrus's decree in 538 was 67 years later. By the time the people returned and built the altar in 536, 70 years were almost up. The edict came about because the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. The Hebrew words translated moved the heart also translated stirred up the spirit, were a favorite expression of biblical writers in the post-exilic period. This shows the sovereign hand of God behind the events of history. Right there, God's seeing to it in the prophets of his word to predict these events, and then the people of the future, as these prophets, prophecies would come to pass, would see these prophets and then go along with it. They had nothing to lose, really. So Ezra 1, 2 to 3, Cyrus said that Yahweh, the God of heaven, had appointed him to build a temple at Jerusalem. <clears throat> Part of this decree is recorded in the Second Chronicles 36, 23. Also, the decree was filed in Ekbatana, where Darius I was found, found it in about 520 to 518 B.C. Ezra 6, 1 to 5. God had promised the Jewish remnant that he would raise up Cyrus as his servant to restore the fortunes of his people. Under the Holy Spirit's guidance, the prophet Isaiah referred to Cyrus by name about 150 years before the king made his decree. Josephus wrote that Cyrus was shown the prophecy in Isaiah 44, 28 and wanted to fulfill it. And that's He wrote that in the Antiquities. So the God of heaven is a title of God used nine times in Ezra more than in any other Bible book, and ten times in other exilic and post-exilic books. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, that phrase occurs only four times. It points to God's sovereignty. He is the one who made heaven. He was who was in heaven, and who reigns from his throne in heaven. Though Cyrus was a monarch over an extensive empire, Yahweh is far greater, for he rules from heaven. It's interesting to note, this is the only book, the Bible, all the other religious books don't have things like this, where there's no contradiction in what God has ordered. Some other area of the, of the world uh, that the, uh, the rel other religious books don't have influence over, things would happen that would contradict that account, but nothing according to the Bible and nothing about the great creator God of the Bible. The emphasis in Ezra 1, 2 to 3 on the temple sets the tone for this and other post-exilic books. The temple was of utmost importance in the life of the people of Israel. Without the temple, there could be no sacrificial system, which was the nation's lifeblood in its relationship to God. 
The God of heaven is also the God of Israel, who Cyrus said was in Jerusalem. Interesting, from the mouth of an unbeliever come these testimonies. 1-4, Cyrus' edict also instructed the returnees' neighbors in Persia to give them the equivalent of money, silver and gold, material goods, livestock, and free will offerings. <coughs> lost my place here. Free will offerings. The free will offerings were for the temple and the other gifts were for the people themselves. This is reminiscent of the exodus from Egypt when God miraculously took the nation out of bondage and had the Egyptians aid them with gifts of silver, gold, and, and clothing. Now God has, was effecting a new exodus, again bringing these people who had been in bondage back into the land of promise, much as he had done under Moses and Joshua. The people had been in bondage in, to Babylon because of their failure to keep their covenantal obligations, which Moses had given them during the first exodus. Once more, God was miraculously working in the life of the nation. Ezra 1 5. Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose. Even everyone, it's all glare, I'm going to move this down a little bit. Everyone whose spirit God had stirred up and rebuilt the house of the Lord, who is, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold with goods, with cattle, with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from the Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. Ezra 1 8, and Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridat, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number. 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls. All these accounting things were never contradicted. 410 silver bowls of a second kind and 1,000 articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5, 5,400. Shesh Bazar brought them up all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So the Bible knowledge commentary on this, Ezra 1, 5 to 11. The religious leaders, priests and Levites, along with the heads of the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that had been taken into exile by the Babylonians, spearheaded the return to Israel to rebuild the temple, the house of the Lord. The Jews who returned totaled 49, 897. The neighbors of the returnees obeyed the king's decree by contributing to the effort. Even Cyrus contributed to the return by giving back the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord. These were the dishes, pans, bowls, and other articles. Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem temple in 605 B.C. Daniel 1 to 2 in 597 B.C. 2 Kings 24 13 and in 586 B.C. So the three three different um, returns and placed in a temple in Babylon. Perhaps the Azagila Ez temple built in honor of the god Marduk. Mithredath is a Persian name, and the word for treasure, a gizbar, is also Persian. So, we have the direct specific details not to be contradicted elsewhere or by somewhere else in history, showing that this was fabricated. In Ezra 1, 9 to 10, the articles totaled 2499, but in verse 11, the total number of gold and silver items was 5,400. Why the difference? Surely Ella, Ezra would not be so foolish as to make a major mistake such as that when he so carefully wrote the rest of the book under the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Even if one were to assume, as do many cities, that a redactor brought together in verses 9 to 11 two variant bird traditions, it would seem likely that Ezra would try to reconcile them in some way. It seems better to suppose Ezra first listed some of the items, perhaps the bigger and more valuable ones, then referred to the total number of items, both the larger and more valuable, and the smaller and the less significant. Another problem pertains to Shesh Bazar, who was called the, the Prince of Judah. 
three views about this identity of suggestion. Some feel that Chess Bazaar was a Persian name for Zerubbabel. Both are said to have laid the foundation of the temple. Zerubbabel, which means begotten in Babel, was a grandson of Jehoiachin, who had been deported to Babylon but had been released from confinement. Zerubbabel's relationship to Jehoiachin would explain the title of the Prince of Judah. However, it would seem strange that Zerubbabel would have a second pagan name rather than having one name that reflected Yahweh worship, Shesh Bazar being a pagan deity. If Zerubbabel and Shesh Bazar were two names of the same person, it is strange that it was never again referred to by the name Shesh Bazar except in Ezra 5, 15-16. Okay, so we're, see we're nitpicking on this thing to see if its uh, variants uh, would re re receive us to make us think that there was some problem here in the text. A second view is in that this man was a Jew and he was appointed governor by Cyrus, but who died shortly after arriving in Palestine and was replaced by Zerubbabel. Though plausible, no solid evidence exists for this view. Third view is that Shesh Bazar was the Shesh Nazar in 1 Chronic 3.17 and therefore was Zerubbabel's uncle. Fourth view is that Shesh Bazar was a Persian official who was sent to oversee the use of that king's money and to make sure the king's wishes were carried out. It has been suggested that because Shesh Bazar was a Persian official, the returnees later referred to him to support their claim of legitimacy for the building of project. So Ezra 6.1, then King Darius issued a decree and search was made in the archives where the treasure was, was stored in Babylon. In Ekbatana, in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found and there was written in it as follows. Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits. 6.4 of Ezra, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers, and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Also let the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple at Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be returned and brought to their places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. So, Babylon's commentary. Let's wrap this up together to see how valuable this is, or maybe there's some contradiction. Tatanai had requested that Babylon's archives be searched for the document, but it was not found there. Instead, the scroll of papyrus or leather was found in Ekbatana, modern Hamadan, 300 miles northeast of Babylon in the capital of Media. The scroll was Ekbatana because that is, where, that, that is where it was in Ekbatana because that is where Cyrus had spent the summer of 538 when he issued the decree. Ekbatana record, this, this record, was an official minute minute, minute, minutes with three details that the verbal and written proclamation apparently did not contain. The temple was to be 90 feet high, 90 feet wide, with three courses of large stone and one of timbers. The project was to be financed by funds from the royal treasury. This shows the earnestness of Cyrus's repatriation program, and the returned gold and silver articles were to be put in their places in the temple. So we have a really historical value corroborating what the scriptures say and how convenient it is for Cyrus to have received this information and that wonderful God supernatural superintending over people who didn't even trust in him to, to follow through his decrees on how his people would be returned from the, uh, the Babylon.